Hey, hey, what's up, guys? We are live. We are live. Welcome to the Fox Shot Sierra podcast. Here we go. Hey, welcome to the Fox Show CR podcast. Once again, this is your host, Franco Sonero. All right, uh, a few quick announcements before we kick off into the show. Uh, Instagram, uh, follow me on, on Instagram at the Fox Show CR podcast, where this is practically acts as my website. Uh, you can check me out there. And uh, my YouTube handle, uh, YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash at the Fox Show CR podcast is where, how you find me. Uh, Reddit, check me on Reddit if you have Reddit. Uh, reddit.com slash you slash fox shots here pod and uh tiktok uh, if it's still around if you guys still use it uh i barely i i should put some more content in there though but if you guys want to check check it out give it a like on your way in uh at the fox shots here podcast and like the video on your way in before i kick off to the show guys all right uh okay let's uh let's review less episodes shall we <laughs> Uh, episode 33 is uh, the fall of the Third Reich. Uh, Germany, like Germany's defeat at this point. It's the inevitable defeat of the, the inevitable defeat of the Nazis. Uh, I went over through that, followed by the Yalta Conference. Uh, practically, this is where uh, FDR, Churchill, and Stalin last meet together. And together, they discuss the, uh, the fate of Germany and the rest of Europe. I go on details on that. Uh, I go over Zukov and Konya's rivalry and how Stalin antagonized it to get to uh, to get to uh, Berlin first uh, for propaganda purposes. Uh, yeah, speaking of the uh, drive to Berlin, uh, I forgot to discuss last uh, last episode uh, Roosevelt's death uh, before the war ended. Uh, Roosevelt died, and well, I'm gonna go through that later. Uh, also, I got, went over the uh, the Volkstrom. Uh, practically, it's Germans reserve reserve forces. Uh, if you want check, if you really want to know what they are, go back to my last episode. Give it a like on your way in, and uh, I discussed the uh, fate of uh, Gregory Zukov, uh, the general that took Berlin. Uh, okay, um, before I go into the Nuremberg trials, um, Roosevelt really didn't live to uh, see the day, see the Nazis defeat, because Roosevelt died. In office, just died, croaked. 12th of April, 1945. At this point, the Soviets were e even... Well, they were near Berlin, though, but they're not at Berlin just yet. So, uh, of course, uh, Churchill really wants to go to Berlin first before the, before the Soviets. Uh, him and FDR share that same view, but fortunately, his buddy's dead. So... What can so what can Churchill do? Uh, who 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 now fully controls the Allied expeditionary forces at this point? Definitely not Truman. Uh, we have uh, our our good old buddy uh, Ike Eisenhower. Uh, Ike actually surprisingly does share that same view as Churchill does. He does want to get to Berlin first before the Russians, if he can do so safely. That's the issue. If you can bring an the Anglo Anglo Americans to Berlin safely, without having actual like catastrophic casualties. He would, though. But at this point, um, the closer to get to Berlin, the, the more violent the war becomes. Like, um, I gotta say, so stop saying that word. Uh, for instance, uh, German forces would actually hang their own people. If they refuse to fight, at this point they are getting everyone, anyone. That's a matter of old men, kids from the Hitler Youth, hence the uh, the Volkstrom. 
And uh, well, fortunately, uh, Eisenhower didn't pull the trigger because he really did not want to lose any more Allied troops than he has to. Because between uh, the West and the East, or the Soviets, is the Western, the, the Anglo Americans, they actually care about their losses because it, it hits home hard for them. Because, you know, that, that's someone's brother, cousin, husband. Uh, yeah. yeah. However, Stalin and the Soviets, and shockingly Russian today, don't give a rat's ass about casualties. To, to them, they're just numbers. Numbers. Oh, we lost platoon. Oh, well. Train a new one. And I, I, that's like their way of thinking. So that's why, uh, they, that's why we kind of, you know, gave the Russians, you know what? Go ahead. Take Berlin. Because they're, they're the ones up to the task and the Western forces really didn't want to lose any more troops than they have to. So they're like, you know what? Russia, just go at it. Whatever. And that's just how it is. And all right. Uh, now to the Nuremberg trial. Okay. Uh, before I, uh, I actually have a video to show you, but before I do that, uh, I just want to introduce you to the Nuremberg trials. Um, and then I'm going to give you the stages and then I'll play a video. All right. So Nazi Germany is defeated May 7th, 1945. Done. Out. So the Allies are victorious. So what do we do? We round up. Any officers for or anyone for interrogation, of course, followed by uh, any uh, laws that they broke that they broke during the war. And so at this point, I'm putting some people into trial because the Nazis really did some really, really horrific. <laughs> like I'm telling you, like we're going to be talk about the Holocaust as well, uh, a little bit brief on it as well, uh, which is this video I'm going to show you. I. Uh, Courtesy of the Imperial War, Imperial War Museum. Uh, go over the channel. Give it a like on your way in. Because they got some really, really sweet content in there. All right, so anyway, uh, the Nuremberg Trials. Uh, they're practically a uh, series of military tribunals held between 1945 and 1949. In Nuremberg, Germany, in the aftermath of the Second World War. Okay, coincidentally, Nuremberg is the birthplace of the Nazi Party. Where Adolf Hitler uh, starts all of his rallies. Uh, go back to my old episode. I think I uh, went through it on uh, Rise of the Third Reich. Yep. And okay. Okay, so uh, the trial was uh, organized by the Allied victors, consist of the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Uh, practically to persecute high ranking political and military leaders of Nazi Germany, Germany's for the roles and the following. Uh, Conspiracy to commit aggression, the commission of aggression, crimes in the conduct of warfare, aka war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Okay, so practically a total of 24 Nazi officials were were, were indicated, including. Sorry, I, I can't read my own writing. Were indicted. There we go. A total a total of 24 Nazi officials were. Or, 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 sorry, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm starting a brain fart right now. 24 Nazi officials have been tried in court, including top ranking military and political figures. Here we go. Uh, some argue would say, hey, it's 22. Well, technically, yes. Uh, out of the, uh, the two, uh, one was unfit fit for trial, and the second is, Practically se commit. Oh, I can't say the word. Uh, committed self deletion before a trial. Yeah, I, I gotta like you know, be careful of my language because you know YouTube and their rules. <laughs> Ooh, baby. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, go over the uh, the stages. Uh, although it's kind of very, very difficult to uh, divide the the, uh, the trials neatly into uh, in, into stages, uh, they, I'm gonna 
do the best I can to summarize and the following phases. Okay, so I, I number these down into five phases. And before I do, activate on, on your way in so I can level up on this algorithm. Ooh, all right. Okay. Actually, before I do, hold on, guys. All right. Round one, fight. Preparation. After the war, uh, the Allied powers uh, mentioned and agreed to try not to war criminals, like I tried to mention before, before I was being a dumbass and started stuttering like fresh. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding, fresh. Uh, shout out to you, uh, shout out to you, Walter and Myron. Fresh and fit, baby. All right. Um, okay, so uh, they started like um, practically using uh, the London Charter of International Military Tribunals or the IMT, was signed 8th of August, 1945, which established the legal framework and guidelines for the Nuremberg Trials. So what, what, th what this means is, like, uh, how are we going to, like, proceed this trial? Are we going to do this the American way, the British way, the Soviet way? Well, let's just congruent it into, like, of course, like, even though the French were Western, as Western countries, sorry, as a, like, even though France is a Western country in itself, uh, they their judicial system is somewhat different as different in comparison to the Americans and the British. Because uh, I believe uh, France really doesn't have juries; uh, only the judges uh, decide the uh, the verdict. So, and that's what they end up doing is having these judges decide on on the verdict, which in this case, uh, Imperial War Museum will discuss it. Okay, so now. Round two, fight. First trial at international military tribunals, which first took place on the 20th of November, 1945, all the way up to the 1st of October, 1946. Okay, so now we brought the 24 major Nazi war criminals to justice. Of the 24 defendants, 12 were sentenced to death. Uh, we're going to include the two that uh, committed self-deletion. Uh, yes, oh, yeah, the numbers are correct. Two, not one, two. We'll discuss that later. <laughs> uh, of the 24 defendants, yep, 12 were technically sentenced to death, but count it down to 10 if you want to be technical. Uh, three were life imprisonments. Four were sentenced to practically a range of 10 to 20 years. Uh, three were acquitted. And two did not complete trial due to poor health reasons. I think, believe, uh, one was uh, sentenced. To death with uh oh what's what's one we're looking for uh an at absentia or absence I uh, committed in I'll explain later sorry guys <laughs> okay now third Round one three fight uh the subsequent Nuremberg trials are also known as the Nuremberg Military Tribunals uh NMT okay so. This consists of 12 other separate trials held between 9th, 9th of December 1945 all the way down to the 13th of April 1949. Okay, this alone was conducted by the uh, con conducted by the United States. Altogether, they tried at least 185 individuals. So these are like uh, secondary people that actually had involvement in war crimes, including doctors, lawyers, judges, businessmen, and other various military leaders. So if we're not gonna, try, so if we're definitely gonna try the uh, the big dogs, uh, each leader and their roles and and the Nazi Party or what's left of it, uh, they try tried other people that benefited from it, resulting in deaths as well, including uh, the Holocaust. All right. Round four. Fight. Sentencing and executions. Okay, the uh, sentencings of those found guilty at the uh, IMT and M NMT trials varied. Uh, practically death by hanging, life imprisonments, and the various prison of 10 to 20 years. And the death sentences were mainly, mainly carried out in Nuremberg. So they all discuss death by hanging. Uh, and now, five. Final round, five. Uh, the legacy. Uh, legacy of this trial. 
Uh, that definitely played a crucial role in establishing the principles of international law and human rights. Yeah, it's kind of hard to say that with a straight face, including what's happening recently and happened before. If you know, you know. It also served as a catalyst for the creation of their international criminal courts. Yeah, about that. Stuff's being broken on that right now. For example, uh, what happened uh, a couple of years back, followed by two brothers, the Tates, Andrew and Tristan. No proof was found, and yet they're charged. What the f***? Yeah, kind of like breaking the laws that you guys wrote yourselves, but hey, what do I know, right? Anyway, back to the show. All right, so uh show you this uh, slideshow here. Uh, all right. Can you guys see that good? Nope. Now I gotta delete this because it is being done again. All right, hold on, hold on. All right. Okay, so uh, let's uh, review uh, the fate of Germany. All right, so just give me a second, you guys. There you go. I gotta close a couple windows, and here we go. Oh, I lost my window. All right. Start this again. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Just, uh, just bear with me here. All right. Can you guys see that well? All right. Good. Okay. So review the uh, the fate of Germany. Okay. This is hence the Yalta Conference that what they uh, what they wanted to decide to do with Germany. All right. So. You see the uh, the one I highlight in blue? That is the British zone. Green is the American zone. That blue is the French zone. And the red is the Soviet zone. And they get this portion to Poland. All right. So the reason why for these occupations is to uh, prevent Germany from starting another war. You know, shame on me once. Whatever. Shame on me twice. Yeah. That, that, that's what I think. In other words, uh, they, 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 they want to prevent this from happening again. So they're not going to take any chances this time. So they divided Germany into zones. And including Berlin as well. Because of Berlin's, Berlin's significant importance, they decided to um, divide that as well. All right. The uh, judges I was telling you about. Uh, judges and, and chief prosecutors. Okay, so the judges on the Nuremberg trials were, were of course, from the victors of the United Kingdom, the United States, France, and the Soviet Union. All right, so from top left on, uh, you have Sir Jeffrey Lawrence of the United Kingdom. You have Francis Biddle of the United States. Uh, you have Henry Donadieu de Vavry of France. And you have uh, you and I. Nikachenko of the Soviet Union. And these were like the top four guys. And of course, you had the following other judges. Uh, Robert Falco of France. Uh, Norman, Norman Burkett of the United Kingdom. John Parker of the United States. And uh, you have Bernard Victor Aloysius ruling of the Netherlands. All right. And, and the chief pros and the prosecutors. Okay. One... This guy was pretty much actually the guy like hitting the uh the not the uh uh what was the word I'm looking for? Uh the accused, practically the Nazi war criminals in in trial. So this guy was hitting him hard. Uh Robert H. Jackson, uh he was the Associate Justice of the United States. Now, practically there's a famous movie on this, uh, made uh actually over 20 years ago. Uh it's called Nuremberg 2000. It um, it, it's a film like uh, Alec Baldwin, uh, played played uh, actually uh, played Robert H. Jackson in this film, 
and you'll see like a few uh famous actors and you'll probably like oh yeah i remember that guy i remember that girl yeah and like, anyway yep and then there is this other uh prosecutors uh you have telford taylor of the united states then you have sir hartley shawcross of uh, britain uh and then you have uh francois de Mathon of uh, france and you have roman rudenko of the soviet union all right now we can play the video before i do that all right guys click the video on your way in All right, without further ado, just uh, let me know when the video is playing or not. The old palace of justice at Nuremberg stages what is without doubt the greatest trial in the annals of the human race. In the dock today are the men who, for 12 years, swaggered across the continent of Europe, ordering mass murder, slavery and robbery on a scale which staggers a sane imagination. This film shows the opening of the first war crimes trial at Nuremberg. In the dock, we see Hermann Goring, Rudolf Hess, Albert Speer, and around 20 other Nazi leaders. Newsreels such as these were screened across Britain, the Allied Nations, and Germany. Those watching this coverage had never seen anything like it before. The Allies were determined that the Nuremberg trials should be shown internationally. They wanted to demonstrate to the world that the war crimes of the Nazi regime were being fully scrutinized. Okay, so the whole world is watching at this point because everyone is out for uh, out for vengeance for what the nazis have done especially the holocaust as well as screening the trials across the world films were used in the courtroom as forms of evidence one of the first times ever that this had been done these evidence films featured horrific scenes from the concentration camps as they were discovered by the allied armies to the allies the think back to the pictures you've seen of the great nazi rallies at nuremberg when these men strutted and smiled and postured before the cameras under the swastika flag and compare them with these poor remnants. The trials at Nuremberg were military tribunals and not jury trials, with the accused tried before judges from each of the Allied powers. The first and most famous was the Nuremberg trials of the major war criminals, which opened at the Palace of Justice on the 20th of November, 1945. The 24 accused were all leading members of the Nazi regime or German military. Okay, so the, I, the Palace of Justice, uh, it was one of the few villains in Nuremberg who, it, that wasn't fully bombed to absolute <laughs> Because during the Allied bombing campaigns, like near the end of the war, we practically bombed Germany to bits. Uh, Nuremberg was completely destroyed. Only a few buildings was, stand, was left standing. Fortunately enough for the Allies, they have uh, they have the uh, the courtroom, uh, like eight like probably eighty five percent erected still, uh, completely like undamaged from the bombs, and practically revamped the place to house these criminals. All right. This was followed by twelve trials of other important figures in the defeated regime, such as doctors, lawyers, army officers, and industrialists. The Nuremberg trial was unprecedented, partly because of its global nature. This was the first time that nations had ever sat down at the end of a war and committed another nation for war crimes. And really, this is why Nuremberg is often seen as a crucible of international justice. And it wasn't just crimes committed in the course of battle. They also created new crimes, such as the crimes against humanity, which were to cover crimes committed against civilians under occupation. And also they tried to prosecute the Germans, the idea of starting a war in the first place. And to me, that seems quite a novel concept. The trial was a mammoth and complicated affair, with some 3,000 tonnes of captured documents submitted. There were many innovations introduced, such as the simultaneous translation of the proceedings into four different languages, and crucially, the extensive use of film. At least it gives the court a chance to see the type of men who claim to be the leaders of the world's super race. Stripped of their uniforms and shorn of their power, they present a dismal spectacle. From the prick balloon of Goering to the seedy misery of Ribbentrop, here they are out of their depth. They are facing justice, and they cannot understand it. The film okay, yeah, they really can't understand it because, like, some guys, um, you know, 
what's his name? Uh, like guys like Alfred Yoda were, were like, but we're just following orders. Uh, he has it made though, but you had an obligation to uh, not do it, but you did it anyway. Those deaths on you on your hands, like stuff like that. Filming was done by the U.S. Signal Corps cameramen through a porthole looking onto the court. Filming was intermittent, but the opening and closing statements from the prosecution, the pleas of the defendants, and the sentencing were all filmed in their entirety. They were a bit worried that the filming might disrupt the court. And indeed, one of the British prosecutors was very amused the way the whole court was set up in a kind of Hollywood manner to best present the trial for film. And that kind of gives a, an indication of the degree to which people were a little bit worried that film might take over the proceedings. Therefore, they were only given two hours a day for filming. And so it's a bit episodic, but it's, some of it is extremely powerful. In what was already one of the most complex trials ever organized, filming added a further level of complication. So why was it so important to the Allies to capture these proceedings? The idea of the film was partly to create the historical record of the sort of epoch-making event, and also to use as proper... Yeah, so... I was going to fast forward to this. Uh, basically, what they're indicating is... Basically, the reason why they're filming is... Basically, for historical purposes, uh, for historical archives, uh, as, set, as a set example of the rest of the nation's aggressive war will not be tolerated. And also uh, for propaganda purposes, as he as he mentioned before. Uh, also. Ah, not important. Anyway. Sis. All resources of modern invention were used to ensure a fair trial. Prisoners and judges. Did you feel that the trial was conducted fairly? I did indeed. I think it was the fairest that could have been devised. Everything was was exposed. Uh, the Germans, of course, had these this immense uh, liking for documents, and documents were produced uh, in their hundreds, day by day. There was a great load of documents. Okay, so in other words, the Nazis really document the living <laughs> out of everything. Like we are talking about, like okay, so like like how many uh, Jews were quote unquote evacuated? Yep. 10,000 here in this city, 5,000 in this village there. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. And so they had this amount of documents on stuff that they did. Like, more than uh, the prosecution has enough. Like, this is abundance of proof right here that the Nazis did actually admit to these crimes. Would be filed, in which they implicated themselves or, or implicated others. The trials validated the Allies' efforts and sacrifice during the war. They proved that their judgments were legal, fair and necessary, and the prosecution of these war criminals was shown across the world. But the filming of the proceedings was not the only novel way in which this medium was used at the Nuremberg trials. Oh, before I move on to the show, uh, that's why I forgot to mention. Um, before... Uh, the reason why they said they only do like one hour per day and trials was because like they 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 want the people to take this trial seriously, not just some Hollywood movie that you like to watch and being suspense. No, like this is some serious <laughs> right here. We're trying this criminals, and they are criminals for what they've done, especially in the deaths of millions. And there's some that. Could have stopped it, but did it anyway. A fundamental element of the trials was the use of film as evidence. Twelve films were shown as evidence during the proceedings. This included films such as The Rise of the NSDAP, or Nazi Plan. Uh, then we're going to show the final solution, the Holocaust. Which ran for three and a quarter hours and made use of Nazi propaganda film. There was also the Soviet production, film documents of the atrocities committed by the German fascist invaders. So every country has their own uh, version of uh, the Nazi Nazi war crimes. Uh, they have the, like their own uh, special version of it, like the, the Americans, the British, the Soviets, the French. Yeah. And the American film Nazi concentration camps, which both ran for about an hour. 
These were edited together from the footage of the concentration camps shot by cameramen accompanying the advancing Allied armies. These are the locations of the largest concentration and prison camps maintained throughout Germany and occupied Europe under the Nazi regime. Pause that right there and make just to show you how many, how many they're out there. Wow. Nazi concentration camp runs for about an hour. And bear in mind, the use of film as evidence in a trial is still pretty unusual. It's happened at the Belson trial. There have been a number of other cases where film around the war has coincided with the trial. But Nazi concentration camps is perhaps the most elaborate use of film as evidence in a trial so far. And uh, Some were extreme when they were showing th these uh, this film in court. Uh, some people just got up and just walked away. And they're just like... <laughs> like this i'm out of here this is, too, this is too much for me like some even sobbed on their way out because they they really couldn't believe what they saw and it contains graphic scenes of the atrocities that were discovered in the camps and also it shows scenes of people who've been tortured uh instruments of torture found in the camp gallows gas chambers that sort of thing but the other thing was really important about it because film hasn't yet been used in trial so extensively the people who made the film were very anxious that it be seen as a legal piece of evidence, as admissible, and that it hadn't been faked or altered. So the film starts with these long written affidavits. All right. Just to show you guys, because I like you guys. David's saying. All right. There you go. This is an official documentary report complied from the films made by military ph photographers serving with the Allied armies as they advanced into Germany. The films were, were made pursuant to an order issued by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of the Allied Ex Expeditionary Forces. Basically, this is authentically shot. Uh, sound, sound by Robert H. Jackson of the United States. So you know, sort of tampering with the film. Uh, it's not propaganda. Just for you guys to actually pause and actually read that, or actually go to an Imperial War Museum's actual video. Don't forget to like it anyway there, and see for yourself. And of course, there is an abundance of YouTube videos that shows the same thing. It's not artificial, it's not fake, and they're signed at the end. The films visually represented the atrocities and crimes of the camps in a way that no documents or witness testimonies were able to do. The American prosecutor, Robert H. Jackson, famously introduced Nazi concentration camps, saying, we will show you these concentration camps in motion pictures. Our proof will be disgusting, and you will say I have robbed you of your sleep. And he literally did. The proof here will be so overwhelming that I venture to predict not one word I have spoken will be denied. There was also a feeling that the accused would incriminate themselves by their reaction to the film. So lights were fitted in the dock to illuminate their faces during the film screenings. There was a court cycle. Uh, uh, so I was, uh, I'm just going to run through quickly before I move up to the next uh, chapter. Uh, there was a court psychologist analyzing their the reactions of, of the accused. Uh, some reason why there were glasses is because there was a spotlight beaming right onto them. Because again, they're being filmed and they people want to see. So some had their eyes bothered. So that's what the word glasses. Uh, of course, you see some actually reacted naturally. They're like, oh my God. Like, what? What the fuck? Like, did we actually do this? To uh, others who had like no sympathy at all, especially Guru, had no, had, had no reaction. Like, coming from a guy who was raised by, Ju by Jewish aristocrats, like, he was raised by Jewish people and he was raised well. And he had no sympathy for this death, especially right face face to face with him whatsoever. But then again, you be the judge. And of course, there are others who are just reacted to like, why are you showing me this? What's next? Cows being slaughtered? Rats being poisoned? Because some of them, like, that's how they see the Jewish people, because that's how strong the propaganda really is. And of course, some are just really, really racist as and just really don't like them. Ecologist who's. I must admit, 
I had to shut my eyes at some of it, even though I knew it. Mm. Which it was, you would, of course. Yeah. It was somewhat walked away, as I mentioned. Was, uh, and I know that Goering, some of the uh, um, things that were shown earlier uh, to Goering and, and, and the men, they shut their eyes and some of them wept. Mm-hmm. Uh, Goering didn't. He went no. shut his eyes. And it was interesting, of course, to watch the reaction of the defendants. The reactions varied. Many of them wore dark glasses. Oh, like I mentioned, uh, because of the lighting. Because some people have noted that many walked away without being brought to justice, and furthermore, that some of the punishments given seemed too mild. While the use of film is also widely praised, it has been noted that to some degree it sensationalised the trials. Variety magazine excitedly reported on the many people from Hollywood who had been involved in making Nazi concentration camp. Dachau, factory of horror. There was a little bit at the time, and maybe even since, there's been the difficulty of kind of disentangling the idea of cinema and Hollywood and to posting film as something as sober and important as, as a piece of evidence. We can't help think that in some, some sense, the film wasn't there purely for evidential purposes. There was a kind of entertainment element to it, or certainly a propaganda element to it. And that that is actually quite a justified criticism. Some people have said, that in a way the trial and the use of film was more like not a trial of the men in the dock, but a trial of the German and Austrian nations. The use of the films as propaganda extended beyond the newsreels. After the trials, the Soviet Union and the United States released two documentary films in cinemas that had been created from the evidence footage and the coverage of the proceedings, a cinematic final reckoning of the Nazi regime. Overall, the Nuremberg trials were considered a victory for justice. Following the first trial and in the post-war era, over 900 trials of Nazi war crimes have been held. The trials at Nuremberg established a format for war crimes that could be easily replicated. It was proven a success. Film is now an established form of evidence in trials of war crimes, genocides, and human rights abuses. Nazi concentration camps. But have we actually learned from this? Have you really? Again, look what's happened recently. Have we learned from this? Our supposed leaders are breaking laws that they wrote themselves. But you'd be the judge of that. I just report the news. Has been used in more than seven other trials. So they've had a power. Because this was the example of what not to do. It's supposed to be a never again. For use as a continuing form of evidence. Some scholars argue that Nazi concentration camps and these other films kind of created the motif for the imagery of the concentration camp that then became re-caricatured in feature films such as uh, Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List. So you probably think, what? Like, there's propaganda for this? Yeah. Look at the films that we watch. Schindler's List. Famous. One of them. So it, it has been a very important film, very significant. The use of the evidence films and the newsreels beyond the courtroom is another legacy of the experimental and influential Nuremberg trials. But it creates a void as well, which I will talk about, uh, especially the criticisms. All right. Okay, so... All right. Now, the defendants. Okay, so just follow along if you're from uh, the top left. Uh, Martin Bormann. Uh, this guy was the head of the Nazi Party Chancellery and, of course, Hitler's private secretary. Uh, this guy uh, didn't go to court, though, but he was tried anyways, sentenced to death. Uh, Karl Dunitz, our good old buddy. Uh, the Grand Admiral of the Kriegsmarine, uh, the German Navy. Uh, then, then again, he became brief Chancellor of Germany, or the brief Führer of Germany after uh, Gibbles, when he self-deleted, actually murdered his family, murdered his children, a lot, like him and his wife murdered his children, and each other they self-deleted one another. Uh, this guy is also responsible for. Uh, the ruthless uh, U-boat attacks in the Atlantic. 
I uh, his policy of don't take prisoners. Uh, like ex- if you see a lifeboat like floating around after you sink a ship, he orders his sailors to execute them. Uh, reason why in his in his uh his reason is because the U boats they barely have supplies for themselves. They don't have any any room nor the rations to feed these prisoners, let alone house them. And of course, you can't leave them. So he orders his sailors to execute him when you see them. So he was sentenced to ten years in prison for that. Oh well, of course, oh, I kind of jumped the gun on that. You didn't hear that yet, but now you know. Okay. So you have three. Uh, Hans Frank, uh, Governor General of Occupied Poland. Uh, you have Wilhelm Frick. Uh, he is the German Minister of the Interior, uh, also responsible for uh, the Nuremberg Laws, which was written on the 15th of September, 1935. Uh, then you have Hans Fritz. Uh, he's the uh, the high-ranking uh, radio propagandist. Uh Basically, he was responsible for uh, sending uh, Gibbles messages out there, practically ordered to. Uh, you'll you'll see like a lot of like a lot of shades of gray in this guy. Uh, then you have uh, Walter Wal- Wal- Walter Funk, uh, the Reich Minister of Economics, Economics, and also the president of the Reichsbank. And all right, here we go with the big dogs. Hermann Goering, founder of the, the, the uh, Gestapo, uh, commander of the Luftwaffe, practically gave the green light to attack Britain, hence uh, Battle of Britain. So he's responsible for the Blitzkrieg in disguise. And uh, he was also Hitler's designated successor. Uh, then you oh, it's another point that Rudolf Hess, uh, Hitler's deputy in the Nazi party. Uh, interesting about this guy, uh, I think around 1942, uh, he secretly went to the United Kingdom to try and negotiate a peace deal, uh, with the Allies. You know, he's tr- trying to do the best he can to like end the war early, and of course, uh, during that negotiations, uh, there's like. <laughs> You know, where's that? Where's that? Uh, there we go. FBI, open up! Capture him and imprison him till the end of the war. So during negotiations in hostile territory, he gets arrested. Now he gets caught and arrested. What are you thinking, Rudolph? What are you thinking? Okay. Uh, next you have uh, Alfred Yodel. Uh, chief of the Germans' High Command Operational Staff. Uh, and you have uh, Ernst uh, Kaltenbrunner, uh, Chief of the Reich's Main Security of- Offices. Uh, then you have Wilhelm Keitel. Uh, this guy is Chief of the German High Command. All right, so you have like actual like top military commanders. And you have Gustav Krupp. Uh, Gustav Krupp. <laughs> von Bolen und Halbach. Uh He's the industrialist and head of the Krupp company. All right. Robert Ley, head of the German labor front and also responsible for the slave labor programs. Of course, this is actually tied within uh, the Holocaust as well. Uh, Baron Konstantin von Neurath. Uh, this guy is the foreign ministry of Germany and the Reich prosecutor of Bohemia and Mor- Mor- Moravia. Uh, this guy apparently tried other uh, opponents of the Nazis. And then you have Franz von Papen, uh, vice chancellor of Germany and the ambassador to Austria and Turkey. Uh, Eric Rader. Of course, you know him from my Battle of the Atlantic episode. He was the OG uh, commander of the Kriegsmarine before Dunitz. And, yeah. Uh, then you have Joaquin von Rip- Ribbentrop. This guy's was famous. Uh, German foreign minister. 
and of course responsible for the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. All right, this guy's responsible for the peace deal uh, between the uh, the Russians and the Germans. He broke that. So we seen like that, and now he's put in trial for that. And you have uh, Alfred Rosenberg, uh, chief Nazi party ideologist. Of course, this guy is the cream of the crop of the creation of the Nazi party. Uh, Fritz Salko. Uh, sorry, I was carrying him already. Uh, basically, he's the, uh, the general for the labor deployment and also responsible for the forced labor programs. Okay, remember back in my uh, uh, the French resistance episode? Uh, they were getting uh, Frenchmen like within military age to force work, and this is not not just France, but, like various countries. Though, but I mentioned this in my French Resistance episode. Uh, this is like he he's tied to that as well. All right, and then you have uh, Helmar Schlacht, uh, the president of the Rice Bank and the minister of economics. Uh, this guy's another president, and you have uh, Balder von uh, von Schlacht. Uh, leader of the Hitler Youth, and also the governor of Vienna. Uh, so practically, this guy uh, commanded the uh, yeah the Hitler Youth, uh, children that become soldiers. Uh, you probably think, oh, that's over, right? Well, I've looked at the American Boy Scouts; they're kind of not that different. They're they're trained to become these law enforcement, military, whatever. All right, moving on. Uh, Arthur Seiss Inkart, a uh, high-ranking of- high ranking official in Austria and later o- occupied Netherlands. Okay, so he later became like pretty much the uh, the commandant of occupied Netherlands. Uh, okay, almost done. Number 23, Albert Speer, Hitler's architect and his armaments minister. So this guy is responsible of, uh, of making sure the Wehrmacht, the Luftwaffe, and the Kriegsmarine are well-armed. And last but not least, Julia Streicher, uh, publisher of the anti-Semitic newspaper Der Struma. All right, so this guy is practically, like, he helped Gibbles uh, really boost his uh, anti-Semitic propaganda. And this guy did not mind doing it at all. Because he actually believed in this. <laughs> right? Right. All right. Before I move on to the verdict, let me just close this right here. Actually, I'm going to read you the uh, the outcome of the Nuremberg trials. Okay, it kind of it kind of remained uh, somewhat controversial to this date because critics argue that the trials were politically motivated and did not meet standards of justice that would be expected of a fair trial. In other words, uh, they think that like you know what, like you should be in trial yourself because you kind of made the similar war crimes. Who are you to judge? Sort of thing. If you get my drift. Okay. So my top three. Well. Top three criticisms I can find. Round one, fight. Uh, the fact that the trials were conducted by the victors of the war themselves, uh, not other countries, just the straight uh, four uh, countries that I mentioned, uh, which some argued uh, undermined the impartiality of the proceedings, uh, otherwise very, very biased towards uh, the accused. And of course, critics argue that they did not provide a fair opportunity for the defendants to defend themselves. Because some of the defendants wanted like other fellow Nazis to represent them, which they they didn't want that because some of these some of the representatives they wanted they should be more crime on, on trial themselves, and so some were very very critical on that. All right, round two, fight. The decision to prosecute only Germans of war crimes while ignoring similar crimes committed by Allied powers. And it has also been criticized for some of being hypocritical. Okay. I'm going to add right here. Okay, so they really accused Germans, but really didn't uh, try other people. Like, I, I there's, uh, I was reading this one part on, uh, if you read Ben McIntyre's uh, book, Rogue Heroes, um, reading this chapter called Operation Houndsworth. And this is where uh, the SES parachuted behind Emmy Lyons, uh post-Normandy 
So all the allies weren't exactly in deep into uh, Normandy yet. And so the SES job was to link up with the French resistance, particularly the Maquis, and do some hit-run tactics. Now, of course, the Germans were pissed off, and they decided to uh, grape and pillage, if you get my drift, uh, these certain French villages that were helping the SES and the Maquis. And most of these troops were not just only Germans, though, but Russians as well. Uh Uh-oh. What? What the fuck? Russians? Oh, yeah. Uh, they call them Grey Russians. Uh, practically, these guys don't like Stalin. But had we had to force themselves in the Red Army. And some of these troops were captured in like, the Barbarossa campaign, the Stalingrad campaign, and the Curse campaign, various prisoners. And some of them had a choice. Some didn't. Uh, some that voluntarily joined the Wehrmacht. Like, they didn't mind uh, playing ball with the Germans. In fact, these Russians, these great Russians, committed war crimes themselves. Uh, they they were responsible for the great pillaging. However, uh, were they uh, being tried to war crimes? Probably. Was it completely advertised as the Germans? No. That's why. That's why people were kind of like, you know, up in arms about that. Like that's, that's just one example. All right. Now. Three. Final round. Fight. They use of torture and coercion, of course, using uh, force or threats to obtain confessions for some of the accused. Uh-oh. So they're kind of playing their own dirty game, right? Which they're trying to avoid themselves. Though some, uh, some argued about that. Critics argued that this undermined the fairness of the proceedings and called into question the... Uh, the validity of some of the evidence presented. In other words, they're, they're saying like, did he really did these crimes himself? Like, for example, they tried to pin uh, Carl Dunitz as responsible for the Holocaust. So, but Dunitz argued that he had nothing to do with it personally. Yes, I'll admit, I I, I, I did those things in the Atlantic, you know, not taking prisoners and shooting them at the sea. Yes, I admit I did that. So, but the Holocaust, that's nothing to do with me. And he literally said, like, I'm just paraphrasing here. All I can do is laugh. Because it has nothing to do with me. And Dunas was somewhat anti-Semitic himself. All right. Now. The sentencing. I was going to burn through these, and I'm going to show you another video very, very soon. All right. So, Martin Borman. (laughs) Sentenced to death. Carl Dunitz. Sentenced to 10 years in prison. Hans Frank. Sentenced to death by hanging. William Frick, sentenced to death by hanging. Hans Fritz, acquitted. What? What the fuck? Yeah, if you uh, go back. Uh, he was the, uh, he was, he's, he's only a, a radio propagandist. So he, basically he was in charge of the broadcast. So again, the judges feel that he personally had nothing to do with the Holocaust itself. It was just a guy trying to do his job. So they feel that he personally didn't have his blood hands, technically speaking, though, but some argue that he has, though, but it's just how it is. All right, Walter Funk, sentenced to life in prison, but later reduced to 20 years in prison, uh, practically due to either from health reasons or from poor or from good or good behavior. All right, Herman Goering. Sentenced to death by hanging. Of course, off the bat, yep. We're like, we don't give a... <laughs> this mother... <laughs> has got to die. But, uh, Goring really didn't want to face accountability, so as he not a coward, he committed suicide hours before the scheduled execution. Practically, someone slipped him some cyanide, and he took it hours before his execution. 
Yeah, I want to kick in the bells of that. Especially for uh, people that really want to see him hang. Real Hess. Life imprisonment. So this guy is sentenced to life. Alfred Yodel. Sentenced to death by hanging. Okay, so I think uh, this guy helped draft the commando order. Again, if you read... Um, No, oh, sorry, uh, Rogue Heroes, once again. Uh, Hitler uh, initiated the order called the Commando Order. Basically, anyone behind, any Allied forces behind enemy lines, whether they're in uniform or not, is being, it gets caught, execute them. Like, <laughs> without question. And this guy drafted the order. He could have stopped it, but he carried with it. That's why he's hanged. I think it's either Alfred Yoder or, or Earth's uh, Colton Bruner. Which he's sentenced to death by hanging. All right. Keitel. Sentenced to death by hanging. Okay, so of course, if you don't know, he's the German chief of the German High Command. Gustav Krupp. This guy was unfit for trial due, due to health reasons. So, it was a trial, he was convicted, nothing at all. It's just how it is. All right. Robert Lay committed suicide before trial, so he ended up hanging himself somewhat. And now, uh, as soon as that happens, they say, you know what? These guys need to be on 24-hour watch. Full alert now. So we can't have this happen again. These guys are not going down easy. So when they take a piss, there's a guard watching. Guy fiddling with himself, there's a guard watching. Doesn't freaking matter. All right, Baron Constantine. Uh, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Uh, Franz von Pepin, another acquitted. Uh, what? He was basically the vice chancellor of Germany, and mostly did he was just the ambassador to Austria and Turkey. So again, the judges felt that his hands weren't exactly dirty or bloodied. That's why they, but that's why they let him go. And a creator sentenced to life in prison, later reduced to 20, 20, uh, 22 years in prison. Okay, originally gets life sentence because uh, he was the one that dispatches the Bismarck to sink the HMS hood and a lot of carnage along the way. Now, of course, again, responsible for, help for the U boat attacks, but even though it was, it was doing its plan, but you'd be the ju judge of that. All right, Joaquin von Ribbentrop, sentenced to death by hanging. Okay, so the Soviets really want to hang this guy, so they hanged him. Alfred Rosenberg, sentenced to death by hanging. All right, Fritz Salkel, sentenced to death by hanging. Helmar Schlacht, another acquitted. Uh, he was just practically the minister of economics. He just counted the money. Even though uh, he saw like stolen Jewish gold and valuables being presented to the bank, but so again, judges felt that his hands were one hundred percent dirty. Again, it's just how it is. Uh, Boulder von Schrack, uh sentenced to twenty years in prison. Uh, Arthur says Inkart sentenced to death by hanging. Albert Speer, uh, he. People would think uh, he would be sentenced to death, though, but he was later sentenced to 20, 20, sorry, 20 years in prison. Uh, if you watch the movie uh, Nuremberg 2000, and this actually happened, this is what Albert Speer did. Um, he actually admitted these crimes, uh, admitted guilt to it, and emphasizes that this trial needed to happen so to, to prevent another aggressive war from happening ever again. Because he mentioned uh, from the beginning, they uh, they advanced beyond trench warfare. After the war ended, you have like jet technology, missiles, rockets with precision accuracy. What if you can strap an atomic bomb and do that shit? Uh, because, of course, this is after the Americans dropped two bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And yeah, and Albert Speer emphasizes that this trial needs to happen as an example to 
future generations that the next uh, aggressive war will be the total destruction of practically human civilization. Because Al Al Albert Einstein even said this. I'm just paraphrasing here. Uh, World War III will be fought by nuclear weapons. World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Kind of self-explanatory right there. Anyway, uh, last but not least, uh, Julius Streicher, uh, the very anti-Semitic man. Death by hanging. All right, cool. All right, uh, this next video, uh, this is one of the, uh, basically another critic like, another criticism fact of the, um, of the Nuremberg trials. Uh, because, yes, the Nazis did some really horrific stuff. Oh, but what, what, were the Allies good themselves? Or were they really the good guys? Well, showing this video, uh, courtesy to, uh, to my boy, uh, Stephen Bolton. Uh, shout out to you, brother. Dom the Marco. He's the one that introduced me, uh, this clip. Uh, it's from a documentary called The Fog of War. Uh, very interesting. Uh, it is, uh, pretty much, uh, doc, uh, uh, discussed by uh, former uh, United States Secretary of Defense, uh, Robert McNamara. Uh, he was the Secretary of Defense during the uh, John Franklin Kennedy administration. And it tells you, like, yes, even though, like, the Nazis did horrific stuff, w were we different? Plays. Oh, here we go. Yep. Proportionality should be a guideline in war. The choice of incendiary bombs, where did that come from? I think the, the, the issue is not so much incendiary bombs. I think the issue is, in order to win a war, should you kill 100,000 people in one night by fire bombing or any other way? LeMay's answer would be clearly yes. McNamara, do you mean to say that instead of killing 100,000 people, burning to death 100,000 Japanese civilians in that one night, we should have burned to death a lesser number or none, and then had our soldiers cross the beaches in Tokyo and been slaughtered in the tens of thousands? Is that what you're proposing? Is that moral? Is that wise? Why was it necessary to drop the nuclear bomb if LeMay was burning up Japan? And he went on from, from Tokyo to firebomb other cities. Yeah, so you already bombed a living out of Japan. Uh... And you add insult to injury by adding a super weapon to it. Yeah, and the um, the, the the defense was we're trying to get the Jap Japanese to surrender quickly and efficiently. 58% of Yokohama. Yokohama is roughly the size of Cleveland. 58% of... Okay, so they're gonna, uh, McNamara is going to do a comparison between the Japanese cities and uh, current cities, say, and the United States. And you just to imagine the, uh, the, ca the catastrophic destruction. Uh, Cleveland destroyed. Tokyo is roughly the size of New York. 51% of New York destroyed. 99% of the equivalent of Chattanooga, which was Toyama. Yeah. 40% of the equivalent of Los Angeles, which was Nagoya. This was all done before the dropping of the nuclear bomb, which, by the way, was dropped by LeMay's command. Proportionality should be a guideline in war. Killing 50 to 90 percent of the people of 67 Japanese cities and then bombing them with two nuclear bombs is not proportional in the minds of some people to the objectives we were trying to achieve. I don't fault Truman 
for dropping the nuclear bomb. The U.S.-Japanese war was one of the most brutal wars in all of human history. Kamikaze pilots, suicide, unbelievable. What one can criticize is that the human race prior to that time and today has not really grappled with what are, I'll call it the rules of war. Was there a rule then that said you shouldn't bomb, uh, shouldn't kill, shouldn't burn to death 100,000 civilians in a night? LeMay said, if we'd lost the war, we'd all have been prosecuted as war criminals. And I think he's right. He, and I'd say I, were behaving as war criminals. LeMay recognized that what he was doing would be thought immoral if his side had lost. But what makes it immoral if you lose and not immoral if you win? There you have it. Don DeMarco for Robert McNamara. Don DeMarco. That guy dropped more truth than ever. Wow. And then another example, uh, the Dresden Firestorm, ordered by uh, Arthur Bomber Harris. Bombed that city maybe double the times. Okay, through the first round. Okay, so a after the first wave ended, uh, the residents of Dresden, they got themselves off the ashes, and then you have firefighters trying to, trying to put out the fires. And then people try to rescue each other from the rubble. And guess what happens? Another wave comes by. Of course, the Luftwaffe is completely destroyed. They, they have no means to defend themselves. Only a few uh, 88 anti-aircraft guns left. So, but they couldn't get all the uh, the Lancasters and the B-17s like bombing the living <laughs> out of cities like Dresden. Hence the Dresden Firestorm. Ordered by Arthur Harris. A.K.A. Bomber Harris. That's how he got his name. And if you look at hindsight, he himself should be tried for war crimes. Because he also tested the uh, use of incendiary bombs in Dresden. Hence the name, Dresden Firestorm. So were the Allies really the good guys? As Hollywood would like to portray? You guys tell me. And that concludes this episode for tonight. Thank you for joining in. Like the video on your way in. So I can level up on this algorithm. And guys, really, thank you for tuning in. And you guys get a Dr. Marco. Dr. Marco. Marco. All right. Uh, my next episodes will be uh me uh breaking down uh the Pacific. Uh, I'm gonna do uh, two famous um battles. Uh, ones that I know really know. Uh, Iwo Jima followed by Okinawa, and then we're gonna talk about Japanese fate as well. And yep, and probably practically the opening of the Cold War. Uh, after that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, I will touch on some like back to back World War One, World War Two stuff, something in between. But yeah. Uh, guys, thank you for joining in, and I gotta go because I really gotta use the bathroom. <laughs> I gotta pee. Oh, <laughs> uh, guys, like the freaking video, and thank you. Good night.